And hi, I am Justine Comley with AARP, the Associate State Director for Northeast Florida. Welcome. We This is going to be a great afternoon, and I can tell you spring has sprung, and we are really excited about having a program here on Let's Do Lunch. Each month, we meet the third Thursday of the month at 1230, and we have great topics that are educational and entertaining and really a lot of fun. So we have a wonderful guest today. Justine, tell us about That's our guest. Right. That's right. So today, like you said, spring has sprung and we're just going to jump right in and dig right into this. We have with us today, Mr. Nathan Valentine. Uh, you might know him around town or nationally as man in overalls. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you for having me. Good to be we're here. We're glad you're here. So we're just going to dig right in. John, that's a little dirt humor. Dig. Okay. We're going to jump right into this. <laughs> so Nathan, if you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what we're going to do today. Absolutely. Uh, like Justine said, I'm Nathan, uh, man in overalls, and I'm here in um, Jacksonville, Florida. I'm actually in my backyard farm, um, overalls farm, and we've got a little, um, about a thousand square feet of bed space where we have folks in the community who pay monthly and they can come pick whatever they want whenever they want it. Um, but today what we're going to do is do a little demonstration about how to um, grow some of your groceries on your patio, your back porch, what have you, in containers. Great. Welcome, Nathan. I have been to the farm and it is amazing. It's beautiful. It looks great. It smells great. But today we're talking about some container gardening and I'm a beginner. Can we just kind of start at the beginning and give us a little place like where would somebody like myself start? I've never really had the opportunity or wanted to grow vegetables. For sure. So the thing is, is everybody thinks that you have to have a farm in order to have a garden. Um, but by and large, what I find is that folks that have the smallest gardens, they get the best yield per amount of space, you know? Okay. And in fact, a lot of folks that have the smaller gardens, they actually have better yield than the really big gardens because they're attentive to it. They, they um, you know, will replant when things die off, when the seasons transition. Um, and you can start in something as small as just like a, a single pot like this. Um, and, um, and what you need is good sunlight and some good soil filled up and, and stick a plant in there. But we'll, we'll go into more details as we go along. Okay, so here's a question. Should you start with a small seedling or with a seed if you're gonna do vegetables or um, a container garden? Sure. That's a great question. And, and the answer is both are fine options. Um, when I'm doing containers, I oftentimes start with a plant just because I, I want something to, to jump up and grow. Uh -huh. um, and um, uh, oftentimes what I do is I, I will plant plants. If I know it's something that takes a really long time to grow from seeds. So for instance, like, um, like these tomatoes here, I usually plant my tomatoes from plants that I get at the store because I can get multi-packs like this, you know, six packs in, in one. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, let's say this costs four or five dollars for, for six plants. Um, these tomatoes take somewhere on the range of like five to eight weeks to get up to size for um, to be good to plant. And, um, and for me, it's worth a dollar or two of um, investing in plants in order to not have to take care of that itty bitty little tiny seedling for that long. But then something like, um, I've got these green bean seeds and um, I usually plant green bean seeds because they just pop up so fast. You know, if, if, you, if you bought a plant at the store, it would maybe be two weeks old, but probably only about like 10 or 14 days old. Um, and, um, and so I'll plant those as seeds. Another consideration is, you know, how expensive is the produce? So if the, the produce is quite expensive, it's, um, it makes sense to invest more in the plant um, than if something's really cheap. So generally speaking, um, things like um, green beans and squash are on the kind of cheaper end of produce. Okay. Whereas something like lettuce, tomatoes, peppers are really expensive. So, um, you know, if you spend even $5 on one plant for a pepper, it's no problem because by the time that pepper has gone on and produced, you know, you made your, your money back 10 or 20 times. Okay. So give us um, some tips. We talked about the container and some where to start with the kind of plant. What about the soil? Sure. So let me go back to the container for just a second because I've got these, um, these, uh, these were just like plant pots that, um, that I ordered some other plants in and then I planted those and I had them left over so I just filled it up. And you can use something like that. You can buy these at the store as well. 
But also, what I want to show you is that you really can use just about anything. So this is a like an old scuzzy five-gallon bucket that I had around my house, and, and I've used it, and it actually has a hole in the bottom, um, which means that I don't have to drill drain holes in it. It's like pre, pre-made um, by accident. And so you could just fill that bucket up with, um, with good soil, and you'd be good to go. And, um, and what you need in terms of good soil is something like um, my, my Magic Mix here, which is a, um, a compost-rich, nutrient-dense um, uh, uh, soil mix that drains well, but it's real rich. So the, the best way to go about this is either, you know, you could go to Cultivate Jacks in Jacksonville and pick up a bag of my Magic Mix or go on my website, Overall Without Life. But if you wanted to just go to Lowe's or Home Depot or, you know, any of those um, uh, Ace, what have you, any of the spaces that sell soil, what you want to do is you want something that says it'd be good in a container garden or the best case scenario is you want a recommendation from somebody that you know that has a garden and say, hey, have you ever bought soil? What's a good soil? Because it, especially if you're not in Jacksonville and you can't get my magic mix, right? It's like what you want is garden, gardener testimonials. Because the, the bags themselves can say all kinds of different claims. Um, but what you really want are, you want to listen for words like, man, that soil is magic. That soil is amazing. Um, and if you plant in that, then you know your plants will have great success. Okay. Um, so when you think about purchasing uh, the soil, yeah. sorry, <laughs> I have a blank, but I couldn't even count with that. Um, so tell us about sunlight. That's, that's Jacksonville right there. That's Jacksonville. That's our, oh, right, Jacksonville. We're live. And we also want just to remind you that we will take questions from the audience. So put the questions in the chat and we'll read them to Nathan and we want to be, get your questions answered. So come on and put your questions in the chat. And so while we're uh, waiting for you to put more questions, we have a few questions for uh, uh, um, Nate. So Nathan, um, how about sunlight and how about watering? Yeah. You know, the Great you know, question. watering things, do those sure. work, do not work? Do you recommend or yeah. not recommend? So in terms of sunlight, what you're really going for is you want at least like four hours of direct sunlight a day. Um, and that can really be any time of day is, is fine. If you can uh, choose, then um, the morning and midday sun is better than that like late afternoon sun. Here, the farm this way over here is um, is east, noon, right? And then that's over there is west. Um, if I had a choice, I would go for morning sun rather than just the afternoon sun. But the truth is, is sun is better than no sun. So always go with the sun. Um, and so if you're trying to grow on a patio or in a, like, say, in a inside of a uh, sliding glass door or something like that, you just want to make sure that that window or sliding glass door or balcony is either, like, east-facing south facing or if you have to west facing um, but if it's north facing it's going to be really difficult um, and if you find yourself in a lower light situation where you're like you know what i think i only have about three hours of sunlight um, the things that you can get away with are the green leafy vegetables and herbs so if you think about like lettuces kale collards um, chard mustard greens those things along with like your your um you know, parsleys, uh, dills, fennels, and such like that, they will do better because the leaves themselves are trying to reach out there and grab what sunlight is available. Um, whereas um, if you're trying to grow like a fruit, like a tomato, and we're talking botanical fruits here, all right? So like squash, <laughs> green beans, all those are, you know, they're technically fruits. Um, those things really like a lot of sunlight because they're just converting sunlight into to sugars and carbohydrates. Um, and, um, and the roots as well. So like carrots, uh, beets, potatoes, things like that. They just need a lot of sunlight. So if you've got a lot of sunlight, grow those. If you're marginal in the sunlight, focus in on the greens. Um, so that's the sunlight. And let me just share, there's this app called Sun Surveyor. If you're, if you're really looking into to getting into this and you really want to check out your sunlight, you can download it from um, you know, the, the App Store, or Google Play or whatever. And it's called Sun Surveyor, and it actually shows you the arc of the sun. So you can see exactly where it will be in the sky and then count the hours. Um, and then, Justine, you also asked about water. <clears throat> and um, I've got my little watering can here. So after I planted, I just would want to water this down thoroughly and soak it um, 
So that, that whole soil column was wet. And then on a day-to-day -day basis, I would want to give it a drink. Um, so Nathan, when I was out yeah. in your garden, I saw that you have a really great drip system. You know, the little tubes that are from basically garden plot to garden plot. Um, yeah. Is that hard to install? I mean, would you consider that a good investment of time and money to do something like that? Uh, it, it's wonderful. It's a little bit um, uh, it's a little bit challenging on the setup, but once you get it established, it's kind of awesome because it means that your watering is kind of on is is on autopilot, and you don't have to have those same concerns of like, oh, right, I need to like, you know, get my my children over. Or I need to get my um, uh, neighbors over to water while I'm away or what have you. Um, the other thing you can do, and I, I forgot to bring out a bowl, but um, there, there are all of these containers these days that have, they're called like reservoirs or self-watering systems. Um, mm -hmm. And basically what it is, is it's like a little bowl, um, you know, the, the shape of it is different, but it's basically a, a reservoir that holds water at the bottom of your container. So you could even in like this container right here, you could just, before you filled it up with your soil, you could put a bowl or like a Tupperware down at the bottom just so that when you water, some of it stays in the pot, you know? You don't want it to be real big because you don't want to water like your plants, but you do just want it to be able to hold on a little bit more. And that way it gives you maybe that extra day um, between waters um, or in a really hot day, then it, your stuff won't dry between morning and night. Um, so I would say if I was doing a lot of containers, that would be kind of my first step is I would do some kind of like a little reservoir at the base or just get something like a, you know, like an earth box. Um, and um, uh, a lot of the um, like garden supply catalogs now, you'll see they'll say, oh, water reservoir at the base. Um, so I would get that. And then um, if I needed to upgrade again, then I would do the, um, the micro irrigation with the containers. Yeah. Would you ever do uh, like rocks or stones in the bottom as a part of that reservoir system? Uh, that helps to lift the plant, lift the soil up a little bit. Sure. You know, really the, the reason that people historically use like rocks or bark in the bottom was just because their soil was so dense. Uh -huh. So it depends on your soil. Like if you're trying to go out and dig soil out of your yard to put in your pot, then you do need something that's going to be sure to help it drain better. Okay. Um, but the, the rocks are less about watering, like holding on to water and it's more about making sure that the pot doesn't get waterlogged. Right. Um, what about bugs? I mean, you know, Florida has got some interesting creatures that land in our garden. So how can you protect and prepare and not mm -hmm. damage your plants, you know, with um, proper preparation with pest pesticides sure. and bugs? Yeah. The biggest thing about pests to know is that pests prey on weak plants. It's just like you know, if we don't get enough sleep and we eat, you know, just drink coffee and, and eat donuts all day, right? Like we're more likely to get sick, right? And we don't get our exercise. Plants are the same way. If they've got good nutrition, they've got adequate water, and if they're growing in season, if you're growing the right thing in the right season, then you have way fewer pest problems. So for instance, right now on our backyard farm, the only things that I've got pests on are the things that I'm trying to push outside of the cool season. So I have like kales and collards and really those thrive better when it's cool. And now that it's getting hot, the aphids are starting to show up. And so because I like to have that kale and those collards, I'm trying to push that season, but really that season's over. And I just need to embrace that it's warm now and, and move along. Um, so those, are the, those are the biggest things, good soil, adequate sunlight, water, and growing in season. Um, and then beyond that, the other cool thing that you've got going for you with container gardens is that with a container, you can walk all the way around almost every plant. And so if you see a hole starting in a leaf, you can just flip it over, right? And you, you find little Mr. Hungry Caterpillar, you throw them on the ground and you step on them and you just did your organic pest control, right? Um, <laughs> but then it, if, you, if you do need to kind of like up your game, then um, if you go on my website, overalls.life, I have a resources tab and I have a little resource called Pesky Pest and what to do about them. And, um, and there's some uh, organic pest solutions for like caterpillars, aphids, um, and all those kind of the main things that we wrestle with here in North Florida. Okay. Great. So these are some great tips. Um, so tell us the difference about trying to grow. And I'm also, I want to talk about inside. Can you grow your plant, you know, container garden inside? 
So talk to us about um, vegetables versus uh, herbs or uh, flowers. In sure. And can you mix them? Yeah. Um, uh, the, the short answer is if you've got enough sunlight, you can still grow your herbs and vegetables inside. Um, the truth is, is I don't have a whole lot of experience with uh, inside gardens. And there's a few, there are a few just kind of different challenges, like, um, like overwatering tends to be a bigger problem inside. Because okay. since the soil isn't getting baked by the sun in the same kind of way, then the soil doesn't dry out. And so if you all overwater your plants, um, the roots will rot and you'll have different kind of problems. Um, but okay. people do it. The, the real trick is just having enough sunlight. Um, and um, and then, yeah, you can mix. So, like, I've got this big pot right here, right? And um, and what I was thinking about is that, you know, I've got a thyme. So we could, like, take this thyme because it's a low-lying plant. And um, You said low-lying? Low-lying. It grows sh close to the ground. Okay, so okay. Kind of drop that in on this side. And then, um, you know, I've got a, like, if I was doing herbs, I've got this rosemary. And, um, and then I could drop this along the other, the back side over here. And that way they could kind of share the pot like that. And now the rosemary will eventually get really big, but you can just prune it back how you need it to. So, like, if it's start, starting to, like, take over your time, you know, I could just clip that branch right there just so that it doesn't overshadow my time. Um, so, yeah, you can certainly mix it up. And um, you could do some low-lying line, um, uh, flowers, even edible flowers. So, like, in the, um, in the cooler months, you've got, uh, like, the Johnny Jump Ups, which are short little flowers, and they kind of taste minty. You've got nasturtiums, which is a little bit of a cascading flower, and it's got an orange blossom that you can eat. It's kind of sweet and spicy. Um, and um, you could do, um, you know, the truth, I, I'm, I'm not that proficient with flowers, but you could do some, like, you know, the real stunted, shorter sunflowers. Um, you could probably get some zinnias in there and things like that. So, and it also depends on your aesthetic. You know, like if people are very type A, a lot of the flowers get a little bit um, hectic, kind of like tomatoes. But, um, but if you're okay with like a con controlled chaos, then, um, then run with the flowers and they'll be beautiful. So tell us what you've got on your table that you're putting, gonna put together in pots. Yeah, so I've got um I've got some tomatoes. These are black plum tomatoes. And now that it's later in season, it's you know it's um, late April. Um, what you want to do if you're trying to still plant tomatoes is you want to plant the smaller varieties like a plum or a cher a cherry, because they um they tend to do better as it gets hotter. The the big slicing tomatoes like beef steaks and such, they will like grow and bloom, but when it's over about 80 degrees at night, their blooms will just fall off and they won't set fruit. So I've got the um, the plum tomatoes. I've got um, I've got an eggplant. Eggplant loves the heat. I've got a pepper, and then um, back over here, um, I've got a Tulsi basil. And this is a, a word to the wise: if you're trying to grow basil in Florida, it's much easier if you grow any type of variety of basil other than sweet basil. So Napoleon basil, Italian basil, Genovese basil, lemon basil. Thai basil, uh, um, Tulsi basil, African blue basil. Uh, honestly, like anything except sweet basil. Sweet basil is just, it's kind of a pitiful plant. So it's the one that we know the most. It's the one you see at the grocery store. But it really just loves like the Central Valley of California where it's hot, but it doesn't ever get humid. Um, because in our climate, it, um, it oftentimes get a, gets a fungal disease as soon as like June, July, August hits with our, our rains. But this Tulsi basil, and I wish, I wish you could smell this through the um, the camera, because it's like, it's just like heaven. It's it, it, it it's a smell that you don't even think should be able to come from a plant. So good. Um, but I could I could put that basil in here. Um, I could put the pepper in here. If I was doing a tomato, just because it gets a little bit bigger, I'd either want to do it in this bigger pot here, or like in this five gallon bucket. Um, and one one other thing to know about tomatoes is um, uh, all tomatoes come in, in two, you know, there's all the like different sizes and colors and stuff, but then there's the shape of the plant and there are determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. And when you're growing it in containers, what you want to air for are the determinate varieties. So it'll be like, oh, this is a, a determinate cherry, okay? Or a determinate plum tomato. 
And what that means is its height, its end stage is determined, as opposed to an indeterminate tomato, kind of has no limit, and it just grows and grows and grows. Um, so if you can, when you're doing containers, you get a determinate variety, and that way they don't go quite so crazy on you. If you've made a mistake and gotten one of those, uh, is it best to stake it? To stake yeah. that? Yeah, staking's great. And the other thing is don't be afraid to prune your tomatoes. So um, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, of using a stake and then pruning all the suckers, um, which um, uh, I can give you a quick lowdown on just in case y'all are familiar with this. You have your vertical trunk and you have these horizontal branches coming out. And um, I don't know if y'all can see this, but right in that armpit between the two, a little sprout will try to grow and it's called a sucker. If you're trying to grow straight up a stake, then you just snip those little suckers out as they emerge. Um, and that'll help keep your tomato much more controlled. Um, but even like today I was at somebody's house and they had not pruned their suckers and their tomatoes were starting to go a little crazy. So what we did, we just kind of like hacked it back, right? We cut like a third or maybe even as much as half of the stems off because they were just, you know, going off every which way. And then we tied the rest of them up together so that they would um, be um, kind of more manageable again. And um, if your tomatoes are healthy, they're going to have a lot of um, those suckers. And, um, and so you can just kind of prune them back and try to save the fruit, but get it back under control. Because the point is that for you to have a garden and have a, a fun time growing your groceries um, and not to be like, um, you know, like you're getting attacked by some um, uh, alien plants coming at you. Okay, we have a couple of questions. We have um, Kathy who's saying, I uh, love, I grow rosemary every year, but I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. And so how uh, am I able to grow it in ground as border? Mm. Um, thank well, you, Kathy, for the question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, rosemary is sensitive to being overwatered. So, you know, I, I would have to see your yard in particular, but um, if you have an irrigation spraying on it, um, that could be an issue. Um, you know, it likes enough water, but then it likes to be drained. So it, it, it's probably either that um, uh, it's getting too much water or that that water is kind of sitting on it or on the other stream that it's just like kind of not getting any water at all. Um, rosemary is one of these plants that strangely tends to do best when you kind of like plant it and, and leave it alone. Um, I can attest to that because I have a beautiful rosemary plant on my porch in the back and it gets direct sun. It, it faces west, it's hot, it's on the marsh and um, and I I barely water it and, and it just leave it to the rain to give it its water. So it's it's a pretty big bush now. Yeah, that there. it's beautiful. The other thing is, is to your point, um, the um, the rosemary really likes the sun. So if it's in a low light environment, it's going to kind of struggle. So that could be it as well. Uh, Kathy also talked about um, being in um, Jacksonville and Fort Caroline and just talked about sandy soil. What what do you do with sandy soil? What can you do with sandy soil is um, is you can enrich it. That's the biggest thing. Um, so you need to up your organic matter in your sandy soil uh, in order to get things to be real productive in it. Because it's it's tough. You know, sand, it just doesn't have anything that holds on to moisture or holds on to um, nutrients. It just kind of flushes down. Um, it's kind of like growing in styrofoam, you know, natural styrofoam or something. Um, so you could um, you could get yourself some uh, like magic mix or, or some other kind of compost and mix it into the soil. Um, the other thing that's really interesting, I had a buddy over Tallahassee area uh, down by the coast, and he experimented with this um, this product called biochar, which is, is basically like charcoal, natural charcoal that he crushed up and mixed into the soil, and he grew test plots of onions side by side, and with only that added carbon like that just to hold on to some water and nutrition, these onions were twice as big as these ones right here. Um, wow. and, it, and it wasn't even that much. You know, you looked at it and the, the sand kind of looked dirty. And that was it. And um, they grew so much better. So you can, can you repeat that. that? It was bio what? Biochar. B-I-O-C-H-A-R. Great. I think we have another question from Janine. Um, yeah. How do you know if it is a determinate variety? That's a great question. If you're buying from a store, then usually on the plant label, 
in big letters, it will say like, you know, better boy or sun gold cherry tomato or something like that. But if you look real close, kind of underneath, usually in kind of like parentheses, it'll say determinate or indeterminate. Um, and, um, and hopefully it'll, it'll say on the label. That's, that's the way you would know. Um, because sometimes you can get um, thrown off by, um, uh, you know, like the, the same, the same cherry tomato could be a determinate and a, or an indeterminate. So um, look for that little mm -hmm. statement underneath the, the main variety name. That's great. Um, I think we had another quick little question about the basil. You had mentioned that the sweet basil is not the kind to select, um, but where would you get that other variety? And, you know, again, can you repeat the names of the, I've heard lemon basil and there was a couple other. Uh, um, I know, right? Who knew? Who knew? Who knew, right? Yeah, because the one that everybody tries to sell you is sweet basil. So the varieties are um, Napoleon, Italian, uh, lemon, Thai, African blue, African spice, wow. and Tulsi, T-U-L-S-I, or uh, also known as holy basil because it's, um, it's a religious plant in India. Um, and uh, you find them randomly at nurseries usually. Y you rarely find them at the big boxes, you know, like at, at the plant centers at Lowe's and Home Depot or Ace. Um, but you'll find them at the, um, the local nurseries. Like I was um, here in Jacksonville, I was out at Gore's the other day. I've gotten them at Plant Place. Um, I've gotten some time to time at Standard Feed, at Cultivate, um, out towards the beach on the south side, like Trads and um, what's it, Plant Place or whatever. Um, so usually it's like the, the nurseries as opposed to the hardware stores. Yeah, that's great. Those are um, really, really great tips. And because I, on occasion, will get a little... Uh, wild hair and go to my Publix and they'll have, you know, the plant, a basil plant for two or four dollars, whatever it is, and just stick it in the ground. So I'm probably assuming you're, that that's a sweet basil if it's a commonly placed. Most of the time. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, so, I'm sorry. And no, go ahead, Justine. So as we are, we have a, a couple more minutes left and uh, we have, you know, great, you, they're showing you great love in the chat and they're saying this is great information i i love learning it's like whoa so what are the common mistakes that people make in doing container gardening can you get it too crowded like you said i heard some say a little bit over watering or mm -hmm. nutrients so what give us some tips as we are uh, closing sure i would say um uh typically as it gets hot under watering is a big issue not feeding your soil your soil is like a bank account so if you're harvesting and removing plant debris you've got to put something back in that soil so you could put something like um, garden tone organic fertilizer um, and every time you har every time you um, remove a plant and like replant another season you want to be thinking about recharging that soil um, that's the biggest thing and the other thing is that people have this complex around um, killing plants and the truth is, is I have likely killed more plants than everybody on this, this um, video <laughs> combined, right? So the difference between an expert gardener and a, and a beginning gardener is not whether or not they kill plants, because we all do it, is whether or not you replant once you kill them. So if you kill plants, just shake it off, replant, learn from it, and, uh, and keep growing your groceries, because it's, uh, it's good fun, and it tastes better, and it's uh, better for you. Well, that's a great pep talk. I because I needed that because you know what it's keep going, keep keep digging, right? Mm -hmm. So those are great, um, Nathan. Thank you so much. Um, Overalls dot life is his mm -hmm. website. He's been a great guest today, and we will see you next month, Justine. What do, I think we've got something fun coming up next month. We do have something fun coming up next month where we're going to talk about music and brain health and uh, how music and impacts great brain health. And so, yes, we will be here next month on the third Thursday at 1230 Live. And we look forward to you to come and join us for Let's Do Lunch. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, y'all. Start planting.